Uh, first of all, again, thanks, Vishal, for uh, making this happen. Um, I, I know um, this is taking a bite out, uh, out of your uh, evening, so I hope to make it interesting for you. Uh, how many folks here are closely engaged with the data world? Analysis, management, storage, vast majority? Wow, that's great. So we got, we got a really, you know, the right kind of audience for this topic. I was, I was worried because it's a topic that can put a lot of people to sleep. So this, this shouldn't be a problem here. Um, so uh, just a quick background. I'm Girish Juneja. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Altisource Labs. I'll give you a bit, of, bit more of detail about this company that you've heard about, maybe likely first time today. Um, and I, prior to this job, and I was looking back when I was you know, thinking about this meetup, and I could look previous 10, 15 years, and one way or the other, uh, I've been trying to work with data, whether uh, it's actually as a technologist working directly with it, or building a technology business around data. And it's funny how the problems have changed in scale and complexity, but the core problems are the same. They have not really altered in the last 20, 25 years. We have new buzzwords, we have new technologies, but the core problems are fairly identical. So we'll go through that and, and see what is different and how we can leverage what's different into solving problems that we have known for a while, except that they're changing to some degree now. So quick uh, start of company overview. Uh, Sheetal, uh, who uh, has helped uh, in making sure that uh, we get this meetup uh, sponsored and organized, was talking a little bit about Altisource. But for those who have not really uh, gotten any details about the company, I'll give you a two-minute snippet. Altisource is based, uh, uh, headquartered out of Luxembourg, but there's a large engineering and product development um, uh, environment right here in downtown. We are in Financial District on 745 Atlantic. And um, uh, this company has grown from about 14 people in February of last year to about 200 people just in Boston uh, today. So uh, we, we have been growing rapidly. And uh, I would talk about the reasons why you will see why the problem we are solving is fairly complex um, and uh, has significant implications, uh, specifically as it relates to compliance. And therefore, we need the best and the brightest to come together and try and address this problem. Um, it is a public company. Um, we, uh, we, have, we, have, we have been, I think, uh, Fortune 100's fastest growing companies for the last year at least, if not more, uh, possibly a couple of years. Strong uh, cash flows, and we are uh, dealing with very large market segments. So what is the vision? Uh, Altisource vision is uh, really to disrupt the, uh, the industry that likely we are all familiar with as consumer, the mortgage industry. right? Um, and how we intend to do that is to be the premier uh, real estate and mortgage marketplace for both the content and distribution to the marketplace participants. Now, that's a mouthful. I'll go into that. You'll, you'll, you'll likely uh, see some of the details behind this through the presentation. The mission is really to offer uh, everybody who's a participant in this flow, all the way from homeowners, buyers, seller, the agents, mortgage originators, for those who have had a recent mortgage, right, like I did in January, that's an interesting process. Um, and servicers, those are the folks you don't really see, but they are the ones who are usually you are sending check to on a monthly basis uh, once the origination is done and they have sold the loan off to someone, some investor. Um, and to do it in a way that they can trust that these marketplaces are compliant, are efficient, uh, and they can therefore make these transactions smoothly and with uh, a degree of reliability on the systems. Uh, when you look at the marketplace participants in the real estate side, the participants, uh, the, the actual actions that happen, home sales happen, home rentals happen, home maintenance, these are the events that happen, these are the uh, marketplaces that need to be put together. And on the mortgage side, you have the origination ma marketplace and the servicing marketplace. When I say marketplace, the reason I, I use that term is each one of the, this activity has many, many, many participants. Uh, even though you, know, you may think home, home buying is like one person activity, but the actual purchase process 
involves many different companies throughout that cycle. And today that process is arduous, it's complicated, it is full of data problems, and, uh, and increasingly uh, it is now uh, the attention of regulatory and compliance domain to provide more regulations, to provide more stringent bounds on how that activity happens. So uh, I will now narrow down my focus to servicing. So servicing is an industry you don't really hear much about uh, because it is a, you know, largely a back office industry. I mean, originator would originate the loan and then uh, li likely bundle it and sell it off to uh, uh, some investor. And then at that point, what's usually going on is there is, uh, you're paying your uh, monthly mortgage payment and that then gets distributed through escrow to taxes, to you know, other uh, things that needs to get paid for. Uh, and that whole process is managed by servicers. It's, it's a segment of the mortgage industry. That process has gone through at least two disruptions in the last seven to eight years. The first disruption happened in 2007. I think we are all familiar with that one. Um, and the second one we are kind of going through now with regulators and uh, compliance officers be, uh, providing more and more stringent constraints ab about how things should happen, in what time frame, how information should flow, and to whom and when. So uh, there, is a, there is an amount of complexity in this process. There is a huge increasing need of uh, compliance. And as I said, because of these two disruptions and several small earthquakes along the way, the industry is going through a lot of change. And this creates for servicers a lot of risk, uh, a lot of costs, uh, increased risks of penalties and fines, and uh, fundamentally decreased customer satisfaction. And their customers are a bunch of participants in the mortgage uh, flow, including the end consumer, you and me. So the state of the business is it is changing dramatically and um, it, it is not tooled for that change. It is not ready for that change in many ways. So what is our vision? Our vision is to, from the ground up, design and deploy and, and sell essentially platforms, a SaaS platform, that would enable the servicers business to get back in health. And in order for them to get back in health, they need a system that is built uh, with flexibility and adaptability to changes that they're facing. It is built with compliance from ground up, not bolted on, but built with compliance in mind. It is built to be scalable and automated because this business is really a scale business. It works well when it's scaling. It actually doesn't work well and it's not very profitable when it's not scaling. Um, interoperable, uh, servicing deals amazingly, actually you would think all I'm doing is sending a payment, but it deals with a lot of third parties. Uh, and I'll talk about in a bit why. So it needs to be interoperable both within its internal uh, environment and uh, with these third parties that are involved. And uh, in addition, one thing that actually has not much happened in uh, servicing industry, it needs to be analytical. It needs to make decisions based on the knowledge gained from enormous amount of high quality data that is there in that system, but unfortunately hasn't been fully lev leveraged either for borrower satisfaction or for better outcomes for the servicer. It's, you know, there are opportunities to do both at the same time, but it hasn't been leveraged. So these are the needs of the future of the servicing industry, and that's really what our you know, near term mission is. That's what we are focused on as Altisource. So this is, an eye, eye, this is really eyeful, so I'm not going to walk you through this. Um, it works well in a smaller group setting. But this is the foundational layer, and I will block, break it down into block parts uh, so we can at least view what's there. Uh, at the top end is customer experience. You saw these three or four or five products earlier. These products need to work seamlessly in a servicing environment. The transitions need to be invisible to the servicing um, business professional who's using the system or the borrower. So the common uh, customer experience is very important. And, and in fact, you'll be surprised to know that in, in this industry, that's not the case. People still have two, three, four screens up and moving data from one place to another it seems like a bit uh, story from 1980s, but it's true in this space. Um, security, so we are dealing with um, uh, you know, fairly personal information. We are dealing with loans. We are dealing with uh, uh, income and information that has high value. 
So security is a very important artifact of this platform, security both in terms of data security and user, user access and entitlement control security. So that we, we provide as part of the foundational platform to all the products. Now, the core business in servicing is all about workflows and rules. So essentially, events happen uh, or there's a human-triggered workflow. Those processes need to be uh, done smoothly and within certain time windows. And then there are business rules and compliance rules, both of which need to get executed uh, in an auditable, timely fashion. And that is really what this part of foundation uh, capability is. It provides that building block to any application landing on top. So uh, the vendor management or some of the other capabilities I talked about earlier, they don't have to re-engineer and retool to deploy this platform. Um, and what we'll focus today most on is in compliant data management environment. This deals with transactional data, it deals with reporting data, it deals with analytics data. This is going to be the core focus of some of the things I'll be talking about um, after we kind of walk through the overall uh, foundational platform. Um, we provide as part of Real Foundation a multi-tenant operational framework so that operators of this platform can manage it. And uh, underneath, we are uh, developing now a multi-tenant cloud provider independent platform as a service. So the idea is we could use one cloud provider, uh, you know, name your favorite, uh, Verizon, AT&T, whatever. You can use one of these cloud providers or multiple and deploy it, and deployment is really smooth of these applications, um, and you're not locked in. We as a customer don't want to be locked in in any one environment uh, as the business evolves and expands. So this layer provides that abstraction. So with that, I'll switch over now to focusing into details of data as a service. Any questions about company, space, the markets we're going after, anything that you know, doesn't set the stage uh, at enough level of detail. Yeah, please. Your headquarters are in? Luxembourg, yes. Uh, so that tells me that national company? We are very entrepreneurial organizations with big ambitions. Okay. <laughs> I'm just wondering how, how much you have to worry about different regulations. We do. Markets and yeah. languages. Yeah, I think all of that comes into play, um, and uh, that is something we design our products um, in mind with. When I talked about multi-cloud, that's an important part of it, so we shouldn't be restricted. In certain places, there's a data residency uh, requirements, so in a country that has data residency requirement like Germany, we should be deploy able to deploy it in German cloud and not have to you know, say we can't do business there. Any other questions? Okay. You are right. So you cannot get rid of paper. You cannot get rid of all the paper. Uh, first of all, uh, regulatory environment is improving in its technological savviness and is allowing e-signatures in many documents. I did my own origination in January, uh, and I did a lot of e-signatures. So from a borrower standpoint, you are seeing less and less of intermediate paper that goes back and forth. You're seeing your input that you provide into the system and final output. So that's simplifying. But on the back end, it's still massive amount of paper. So what we are trying to do is simplify that. So the management of that process and what do you do in order to have accurate data at the right time to act upon, which otherwise is only sitting on the paper, is something we are investing in and building out. That's a really good question. So there are multiple participants, like I said, in this marketplace. There, are, there is the servicing uh, business professional themselves. There is the investors who are buying these loans and who have given the servicing rights to a servicer. There are borrowers themselves. I mean, I go to my servicer, I log in, and I check, you know, my payment posted or not. Actually, I don't, but I can. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, you know, those are all customers.
Yes, we are an offshoot of Altisource. No, uh, let me be very clear. We, uh, Altisource was spun out of Aukun in 2009, and since then has been an independent publicly traded company that is providing technology and business process services to this industry. Does it answer your question? Okay, anything else? Okay, great. So let's get into some, some more details. So environment uh, overview, I think I've said it enough, but once more, uh, finan mortgage industry faces this, but this is true of entire financial industry. I mean, FINRA regime, many of you, I, I spoke to someone else who was very familiar with FINRA, is, is somewhat similar in the trading space, trying to kind of have more uh, uh, kind of uh, controls around how that system operates. So they're increasing regulatory environments, there's increasing customer compliance requirements, which is different from regulatory environments. This is, you know, um, their marketplace as participants and participants enforce certain compliance requirements of their own. Um, and these uh, changing requirements require data correlation across different silos. I mean, this industry has had many data silos. And now what is needed is essentially more horizontal view of the data. How do you create that? And then when you're doing risk analysis in this market, it requires correlation of internal and external data sets, uh, which is not something easy to come by in, in, uh, or not available today for this uh, custom, uh, customers in this space. And existing data stores which are there, they are largely uh, serving a specific operational or transactional need, so they are not able to respond that quickly to these changes. And usually if you go to you know, um, uh, an IT shop at one of these companies and you say, we want you to do this project, they'll come back with 12, 18, 24, I've heard 36 month time windows to do changes which compliance requires you to do in next 60 days or next 30 days. So it's, it's, it's really a huge disconnect between the time to have that change and the time in which the change can be delivered through internal uh, capabilities. So with that, what is the typical solution for problems like this, right? I mean, many of us have had experiences, direct or indirect, with enterprise data warehouse term. That gets thrown a lot. Um, so well, why don't you build an enterprise data warehouse? Well, guess what? Many of these environments have not one, multiple enterprise data warehouses um, because of the silos. And um, the, but if you were to go the enterprise data warehouse route, what you would do is you would come up with the, the facts and the dimensions in this domain. So the terminology is there are some facts uh, such as in this environment, borrower, uh, borrower information is a fact. I mean, it is the borrower. That's, that information isn't going to change till that loan is alive. The investor information isn't going to change. So there are some facts, and then there are dimensions. Dimensions are, you know, um, uh, various characteristics of that borrower. So essentially, it ends up being a star schema. You come up with the core facts, and then you have dimensions around those core fact models. So you can create a data warehouse of that kind. Uh, it'll be, you will carefully design the facts, you will carefully design the dimensions. Uh, you would typically do what is shown here. You would typically uh, worry about what is the metadata around this data warehouse. Uh, you know, in enterprise data warehouse, the standard best known methods are all functionality has to be metadata driven. Uh, you would have uh, very, very tight data definitions with strong change controls, revision controls. So you have this knowledge of what this data really means and you can, you can control it, you can change it. Uh, you would ETL out, you, for those familiar with ETL term, I can explain this, extract, transform, load out of existing data sources. So you would ETL data out of source systems. You would typically have a cleanse it. You would transform it. You would make a single copy of that, especially the dimensions and the fact models, and then you would insert it into the data warehouse. You would uh, have fairly tight controls over the change in that data warehouse. It will have to go through process governance because this is really the, the quote unquote the truth for the uh, organization, and um, it, the data, data changes have to be very carefully thought about. And finally, 
once, if you need to use data from it, you will then create access methods and you will bring it out into data mart or you'll materialize into views that you can use for specific reporting type application. This, is, this works wonderfully well. I have nothing against enterprise data warehouses. We, we have one. I'm, I'm sure most companies have one or more than one. Um, but there are some challenges. And the challenges are the, the change process involved in this environment is tedious, it is involved, and it's brittle. This is where I talked about you get, if you go to uh, environments that have enterprise data warehouse and you say, well, you know, my dimensions are gonna change dramatically or I need to do a very different kind of query on the system and I need to materialize a whole different view in order to do that. The change timeframes for that that comes back is not weeks, it's months sometimes, and it's, it's you know, I've heard more than a year. So what do you do in such an environment? You're in a compliance environment, you have a lot of change happening, and the standard solution is not enough. It is providing value, but it is not enough. So this is really where um, some of the big data technologies come into play. And I use that term very carefully. Uh, I've been involved with big data since 2010. Uh, we started with uh, prior to uh, moving to uh, getting uh, uh, hired as the Altisource CTO. I used to work for Intel over in West Coast. And um, there was a lot of work going on with Hadoop uh, in very early days, 2009, 2010, when it was still you know, 0.4 or some lower version, not ready for prime time. And um, I use this term carefully because it gets used a bit too liberally right now. And unfortunately, there's not a better term to indicate those kind of technology sets. Um, the, the driver that I look at some of these open source technologies is uh, there is a lot of, in most cases, the Twitters and the Facebooks, and there's a lot of unstructured data. There is a lot of data uh, that is not coming out of enterprise data warehouses or source systems. Uh, there is a huge amount of stream data. There are folks here from IoT, IoT domain uh, that are talking about health data coming from you know, multiple devices on an individual. Uh, and then you're trying to collect that data. First, first problem is how do you collect that data? The second problem is how do you actually make sense of that data? And the third problem is how do you life cycle and kind of manage that data? So big data technologies originally emerged from that problem set. I, I still remember uh, projects with China Telecom, China Unicom, which were facing you know, 500 million subscribers trying to deal with their data sets. I mean, just imagine the amount of cell calls they're making and, and the data sets they're generating. So they're really good at that. Um, uh, there's, there's, uh, but when you begin to look at it and say, how applicable are those technologies in environments such as what I just painted? So fairly structured environment. Data is reasonably well structured. Now, it may not be all relatable, but it is structured. Does it play a role? And, and the answer that we found, and this is through our efforts, by the way, there are a couple of people here I would call out who have helped a lot with doing work that has gotten us to this point and will likely take us to the finish line. Uh, there's Surat Prakash here, Surat, if you could wait, who's our uh, chief architect on this uh, platform, and Data as a Service, along with Hari Ram. So they, this is kind of two in a box pair that is working on this uh, platform. Uh, Hari Ram, if you could wave. Right, those are two individuals that I want to introduce because I'm the voice, they are the doers. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, what we found out is if we deploy a combination of these technologies and we do it very carefully, uh, we can get a lot of value that our, you know, the businesses we are trying to serve are looking for without losing the fidelity, without losing some of the other benefits you get by using traditional data management mechanisms, and I'll talk about it in a bit. So we call this data as a service, I mean, you know, there are various names. Um, everything as a service right now is cool, so that's why it's data as a service. But actually, I think it is, it is data as a service. So let me, let me walk you through how it works. So on the left-hand side, you see source systems, right? So in our case, there are a bunch of source systems. They could be ours, they could be at customer sites. There are various ways these source systems could, could provide us data. Uh, so you, 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 the one jail you don't get out of it, you do need to get that data out in order to do anything at it, uh, with it. So there is an ETL element to it. Uh, there is uh, an element of messaging to it. But when you get that data out, you try to create what we call as master data. Master data is 
data about key uh, facts in the system that are not going to change, that, that, that actually everybody refer to, uh, and we need single copy of that master data in our system. Um, and, but at that point, rather than taking that data and putting it in a, you know, uh, through a process of transformation and cleansing into a warehouse, we put it into a data lake. And I'll talk about what that lake is. So the, the benefits of the lake, and let's stay with that notion, we'll get into what exactly it is, uh, is that uh, we are not trying to predefine what we're gonna do with this. We are not trying to predefine how we store this data. Uh, we are basically pouring a lot of data in the, into the system, and we do it for, we keep doing it over historical context. So we, it's not a snapshot, it's not an operational data. We are continuing to pour that data into the lake. And from there, we cleanse it. We, um, at that point, convert it into facts and dimensions uh, for specific warehouse needs or, or uh, ODS type needs. We kind of mix those two frameworks in our integration hub. And then finally, uh, either directly from Data Lake, and I'll talk about examples of that, or through integration hub, expose that for analytics. Uh, we, we do a lot of analysis on our data. You know, we have a lot of clustering algorithms. We have a lot of graph analytic systems on our, on our uh, data sets because we are trying to figure out uh, better ways to provide um, value for multiple participants in this marketplace. So there are various uh, ways we can do that if we use analytics carefully. And that's the flow that we put together. And, but we expose it using a service layer that we call data as a service layer. And I'll, I'll give you examples of how that works. The usage is slightly different for each one of these data sets. For the master data, uh, uh, first of all, if you need real-time data, you will still go to source systems. So if you need something that is a state as of right now, you're not gonna go to any one of these environments, you're gonna go to source systems. If you wanna get uh, cleansed and confirmed data about key business entities in the system, you know, like I said, borrower, investor, and so on, you will go to the master data. If you want to get non-real-time, time series type, uh, aggregated data or product data, um, then you would go to the lake. And if you're trying to get this single kind of the source of truth, the cleanse and conform data about the facts and dimensions you have nailed that you need for different business reporting needs, you would go to the integration hub and um, any sort of um, uh, you know, aggregates at a mass level that you need to expose for reporting purposes, you would go to the presentation layer. I, I think this will be clear when I use an example. Um, let me actually switch to the example. So an example is borrower data service, right? So I want to find out, um, you know, the, I want to find out some information about a borrower. Now, what I find, want to find out is the, either the current information, I'll give a context to, to the service. Either I'm trying to find out current information or I'm trying to find out cleansed and conformed information or I'm trying, trying to find out historical information because you know things could change over time about a borrower. Um, and uh, the, so this showed request and response which I think is hard to read so maybe I'll walk you through here. Um, so if you want real-time borrower data, the data as a service will go to the source system and get you that data. If you're looking for uh, cleansed and conformed borrower data because it happens to be master data, it'll go to the master data management system. If you're trying to get historical data about a borrower, you will go to data as a service. If you need to do some quick analysis or, or you need to do even a quick report based on borrower's historical data, you would still go to uh, the lake. So let's look at other examples. Uh, mortgage data service. So mortgage is not core entity, right? Mortgage changes, somebody's, you're paying money every month, it changes your amount, you, maybe at some point taxes have gone out, it changes what escrow is uh, gonna happen, maybe you called in and change your escrow amount. So this is not a business core entity, it is a derived element. Uh, here, if you're trying to get current information, you would still go to source system. In this case, you'll go to the loan servicing database and you'll get that out. If you're looking for historical changes in the mortgage over the course of last 20 years, different events that have happened, uh, different payments that have been made, you, you want to get that context immediately, you would go to um, histo uh, mortgage history data on Lake. 
when I say immediately, I use that cautiously. It's not immediate in real time. It's immediate as in, you know, in matters of minutes or hours as opposed to days. So you're not running it on Hadoop, and I'll get back to that. Um, and then if you want cleansed and conformed data, then you would go to the hub. But again, the data as a service is hiding all of that. You give it a context, you tell what you're looking for, it'll go find it for you. And that simplifies all the upstream products I talked about and what they need to do in a way that makes compliance really easy to achieve, which otherwise is actually a big, big challenge in this industry. Uh, this was another example. So the other, other way data as a service can be used is as a published subscribe. So in this case, an event happens, an event gets triggered out of data, and that event needs to get results in some action downstream. So as long as uh, you're subscribed to the data as a service, you will get, get, get that event, and you can act upon it. And the assumption here is obviously you're authenticated, authorized, your entitlements have been checked when you're calling that service to give you that access. Okay. So a uh, quick comparison on, on Lake versus Warehouse. Um, my, and again, this is our observation. If you've seen uh, something else, I'd love to talk. This is a space that's still maturing. The terms are still more buzzwords than content. So um, everybody likely has a different interpretation. So I'm keen on, on listening to yours as well. Um, but what we have seen, data volume is, is larger. Uh, well, this is no surprise for us. We keep history forever on the lake. Uh, in data warehouse, we only keep the amount of data that we need for the warehouse needs. We don't keep all the history forever. Um, access methods typically on Lake are no SQL. I'll talk about how we have deployed it. Warehouse typically SQL. Uh, uh, if you're familiar with schema on read and schema on write concept, uh, what that means is you have predefined what you will query the store for, uh, for the warehouse for. That is the schema on write. And schema on read is you have not predefined, predefined it. You're defining it at the time of query what the schema should be. So that's the schema on read. So lake typically is schema on read. Warehouse typically is schema on write. Now lake allows you to do schema on write, but it's more value is on schema on read. Uh, the scalability is different. Uh, the lake needs to scale horizontally because if, you are if you're tied to cost per terabyte or cost per petabyte, that is in tens of thousands of dollars then you'll never really build a lake because it'll be cost prohibitive. Um, commodity hardware versus commercial engineered systems uh, in, in both cases. Lake can deal with structured and unstructured data. You should be able to put any kind of data on it because uh, you know I, I don't know whether we'll have time for a demo, but we combine data from Redfin that comes in about the current values of, of loans, uh, current values of homes, and compare that against 30-year history of uh, loans that we have for some loans that we have a 30-year history and can, can show how that loan-to-value ratio is changing over time in a particular zip in a particular area, which makes for better decisions from different participants in, a, in the marketplace. Um, the data in Lake is typically raw, and data in Warehouse has to be cleansed, aggregated, uh, no orphan data. Uh, everything has to kind of have a lineage and, and tracked. So uh, one level deeper dive on a slide that is unfortunately blue, uh, white on light blue, which is not, I think, presenting very well. Uh, you can see these are, now the earlier slides were made by business guys, these slides are made by engineers, so you can see the difference. Um, so the, uh, the technology stack we are using for Lake is Apache Spark based, and um, uh, it has actually been a very interesting experience. Uh, the earliest big data warehouse came around HBase. How many are familiar with HBase? Yeah. So HBase is still a very powerful system, is used uh, quite widely. Anybody who deployed uh, kind of a warehouse-like system on Hadoop in 2011, 12, and even up to early 13 would likely be deploying it on HBase. There wasn't an option. Um, uh, but I am increasingly convinced that Spark is going to be the platform of choice for these deployments. Uh, for those who are not, not very familiar, Spark um, uh, provides these, uh, uh, Spark is basically in-memory processing versus disk-based MapReduce that Hadoop is, to keep it very simple. Uh, so you are having horizontal RDD in-memory blocks of data that you're computing on, 
on a scale-out architecture deployed on commodity hardware. You can parallelize your queries. It deals with all the details of parallelization, combining, joining, and what you get is a very high-performance system that can work, you know, and I'll show you some of the performance data, work very efficiently in a data lake environment where the data sizes are vast and, um, you know, make this system uh, be useful to business, which is looking for very quick answers. Uh, so we, we, we deploy Spark. We use a, a HDFS as the storage. We also have Cloudera deployment, so, you know, you could use CDH um, as well. CDH Cloudera has announced uh, the plugin for Spark, so you can directly query on top of CDH. Um, and we use Hive queries that are embedded within Spark UL uh, in order to query this environment. The temporary results of this, we are able to store in a Parquet file. If you're familiar with Parquet, it offers very efficient uh, storage format. And so you can store that, and, and therefore now you have materialized views. So very similar to the warehouse model that I sh showed earlier, where you have the uh, cleansed kind of fact and dimension model, and from that you materialize the data mart. Here you have essentially those Parquet files, which are the materialized views that you can act upon down the road that, that uh, it provides similar functionality. The beauty of this is I can use this for reporting. Um, I can use this for ad hoc reporting. I can use this for schedule reporting. If I need to run clustering algorithms or I need to run graph analytics on it, I don't need to move data. I can run it right on top of this data. So if you look at it from overall business standpoint and you look at Lake Warehouse and, and uh, you know, presentation concept, this is where you come to when your questions are complex. Uh, they are usually not that often. It's the way I look, like to look at it is 80, 20. 80% 80 you're going to the warehouse, but 20% you're coming here because this is the only place that can give you that answer. Uh, but when you're coming here, those are very high value type of queries. You are looking at new business opportunities. You're looking at value in the data. You're looking at a compliance request. So in our case, it's mostly a lot of compliance requests. That, are, that, are, that couldn't have been designed into a warehouse that was designed four years ago, you can get it out of this system. So that is the, the real value of making the lake and the warehouse kind of work together in order to provide data as a service along with master data management. So uh, again to, sorry, you had a question? Yeah? Question, may I? Uh, how do you solve the data quality problem with the data lake uh, without going to the so, you know, engineers. <laughs> so we have, we have to, one of the things I'll talk about is gaps, right? So, so uh, we all feel, uh, many of us who have been working on our field, Spark is really the right way to go, but there are gaps. There are a few gaps that prevent us right now for deploying this in production. So we still have it in our testing lab and, you know, we are baking it in. The two or three gaps are one, um, while you, you want to do schema on read, you still want to keep the context of the metadata that it originally came from. So how do you tie it closely with schema on read? How do you use that metadata concept on read? Data quality is another one of those, right? Today, the only way we can do it is by layering, by coding on top of that to have, at least for some of the core artifacts. So a lot of, if you go back to my other picture, right? Master data got addressed in master data management, right? So you have their clean copy of master data. So you, you are never having dirty copy of master data. I mean, master data is clean. It's a question of all the other data sets around it. And there in Lake, if you're going to use Lake for uh, things that require data to be cleansed, then you would have to code that in. So this is why we look at Lake more as uh, aggregated responses more as things that do not, um, uh, you know, are not constrained by a specific element's quality error. Because if that's the case, you would rather go to warehouse. But you can code it in. I mean, it's at the end of the day, you're writing uh, on top of Spark, you're, you're writing Scala code, or you're writing, you're, you know, Java code on top of that to put certain rules in. And we do have the rules framework in which you can design those data quality rules. But the, the key here is to draw the line between warehouse and lake, right? I mean, so it's just enough to serve the needs of the lake as opposed to making that the source of cleanse, cleanse data. It's not. Yes. No.
No, master data will give you master data directly. Right. It's okay. not going to come so from they Lake. Are, they, are they are connected, yes. No, see, this is why we have data as a service layer. You provide abstract, you provide your query with context, and it abstracts all of those underlying data artifacts from you and gives you the response. One of the challenges is, and I don't know, I'm sure you've lived it too, uh, warehouses over life uh, gets, get less and less as true warehouses and become operational stores because business users often are provided direct access. And they say, I can do this, why can't I do that? Why don't you add this capability onto the same warehouse? So that challenges are rampant in our industry because the warehouses have been deployed several years ago. So a lot of those warehouses no longer are true fact and dimension models. They're a mix of ODS and warehouses. But the only way we can isolate yet provide value to the business user is by having that service layer. That's where the control is, and it decides where to route that request and get you the response. Does that answer your question? Yes, I mean, the challenge is like, uh, you have so much data in the data lane, because you have structured and unstructured, mm -hmm. and you don't really know what type of queries are coming, even though you have control of the data as a service. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes people get excited and they try to come up with some different patterns, because they see a lot of data, they may end up including something which is not right just by looking at the data. So is there a chance that they go into a totally wrong direction just because they have so much data clearly? So do you guys control anything? Because uh, that's one challenging area. Uh, like I think, um, I, you know, one way to look at it, data is what it is. The interpretation is what makes it right or wrong. <laughs> so the uh, there is definitely a governance challenge. I, I, I won't say there isn't. So there is a level of um, oversight you need to put on how do you use this data. Data as a service abstracts some of that but doesn't completely get rid of it. So the idea is simplification. In our case, one benefit we have is a lot of upstream systems, it's, it's like a SaaS offering, right? This is the core platform, data as a service is exposed and the upstream systems that are deployed that are using data as a service. At the end, customer is coming in and using the entire stack. So we have a lot of abstraction from the user at the end trying to use this system. But even within the environment, there is definitely a governance challenge. Yeah. yeah. How do you handle uh, authentication of if somebody's only allowed to look at a certain segment of the data? Is that in the data service layer, or are they only allowed to go to one of the later things, or are they allowed to look at segments of the master data environment? So we have, we have um, um, any user access is always controlled, as in it has to come through a place where they can be authenticated, they can be authorized, and their entitlement can be verified against an entitlement engine. Now, entitlement could be on data, entitlement could be on a service. So yes, I mean, when they come into the system, add the data as a service layer, their um, uh, credentials and their entitlements are going to get verified before they're given access to any data set. Now, the, the, this goes back to one of the issues in the Spark environment, and actually we are, to Sheetal's point, we are hiring engineers. Um, the Spark environment is phenomenally powerful, but it has certain weaknesses in the multi-tenancy and controlling access area. Now, we are deploying it on Yarn. So through YARN controls, we are able to control the, the, you know, the resource pool somebody has access to. But the next, next level of granularity is still a problem. So uh, in, in Hadoop, for example, over the course of last two years, um, some of the things that the community did, by now there is actually a cell level, for example, access control available on HBase. Uh, there is encryption in, in HDFS. There is a lot of security that has come in. Spark is still younger on that, and I expect in the next 12 months that to transition because the focus now is how to make Spark production ready. Yeah. So if I wanted to uh, plug in a brand new uh, source system or if there's an upgrade to an existing one, um, what is involved to make that? New data available into yeah. the yeah. service layer and how long can it Yeah, so assuming that 
you are still in the same vertical industry, which means the master data isn't changing. This is just another source system. Then you would actually take the ETL out of that system, put it into the lake. Now, the work, the, the real work is, what do you need to do with warehouse? I mean, is it adding a dimension to the data that you have in the warehouse? And that is, again, an engineering effort. Anything to touch, that touches the warehouse ends up being a, a time lag issue where you have to cleanse the data, you have to transform the data before you can load it as a dimension in the warehouse. But up to the lake, it'll go very quickly. Okay. So most of the data in your data lake is format because you get it from the master data, which is format, right? No, you don't get it. The picture is slightly misleading. Master data is only the master data for the entire system, right? So it doesn't have all the data. Master data is data about the, there are some core entities in the system, like borrower, like investor, and so on. Master data is data about those entities, the single copy, single source of truth for the core entity information. There is a lot more data sets. I mean, we have, um, in one of the tables in the lake, uh, we have a trillion rows. So there is a lot of other data that happens because the loan lives over 30 years. There are a lot of interactions that happens with the borrower. There are a lot of interactions that happen that changes the state of the loan, the regulation change that happened, which changes some of the payments. It's, it's, think of this as series of events. There are tons of events that are happening on that one mortgage, and uh, all those data sets are not in master data. So the so, lake is pretty wild in that sense. Yes. And yes. It's pretty unstructured. So how do you control the error rate when you get the schema read? So when, when you say, let's be, let's be more specific, when you say error rate, what error rate are you referring to? Um, when you look at unstructured data, yeah. it depends on how you interpret the data. What you want to see from it might not be the truth what you're looking for. So how do you control that? So again, the, I go back to the 90-10 rule, right? The lake is designed for um, first providing a quick environment where you can pour the data as it comes from outside so you can take the other actions. That's one. Two, if you need to run the kind of analysis that none of the other systems would allow, and it does not require for very high quality of individual elements of data that is in it, but as a, at a collective level, it gives you that enough information in order to answer some questions that no other system would let you do it. As an example, we would do uh, entire table scan. Um, we, you know, this is a trillion row example in the system. The only place we can do it is in the lake, and that gives us certain business information that is useful uh, from a business context that does not require every element of that to be perfectly accurate, as an example. Yeah, there is a trade-off. I mean, it, it is a system. Now, the only reason data would be inaccurate is if it came in inaccurate, right? Because we are not uh, modding data in the system. So if the source system, when you extracted it, you didn't cleanse and certify and make sure it wasn't orphan data. We may have orphan data, for example, lying in, in the lake. The data nobody is using, but it's lying there. Uh, you may have external data sets that have come in that have their own set of quality issues of some kind. So those are the places when you said incorrect data or data or something with an error. You look at the data because it's unformatted. So there's a different way of interpretation error also. Right? Do you have that error rate? Yes, so we, again, we, this is not uh, an environment where you're trying to pour tweet stream, right? Whatever you're getting still is a fairly uh, well understood data set from well trusted sources. So this is, this is different than having a lake for a tweet stream, right? Now, yes, it's a little bit wildness, but yeah. not totally wild. Yeah, it's not totally wild. Okay. okay. So I, I want to kind of make sure I'm, yeah, go ahead. Can you describe and talk a little bit more about the role of metadata? Like, um, so what's the thing to most metadata, and then and when it's sold to uh, a customer or a provider, where, does, where is it coming from, or why, why, what is it, and what is it used for? How do people use it? So uh, if
if you look at warehouse, right, in the warehouse, typically you want to do all uh, business and uh, technical views into the data using the metadata. So metadata is your control system that tells you how you use your warehouse. In the lake context, this is another area where technology uh, improvements in this domain are still lagging to make systems very resilient. Uh, there are actually now companies providing uh, a way to maintain uh, the incoming metadata in a lake type of environment, uh, but it is still new. It's an area that, that needs more work. We are doing some of that work. Community is doing work. Other companies are doing work there. But at the end of the day, metadata gives you the, the information about what the data really is. Uh, in the warehouse, that is very important. In lake, it is somewhat important. You need to know what it is. But again, unless it is street stream or it's some wild, wild west, we know the streams we are putting into it. As long as we can keep the history of what got put in when and where it is, that's the metadata layer for the data lake. That, with that much knowledge, we can do a lot. All right, so what's the functional flow? This is, this is the functional flow uh, in which this works. You pour, you pour your data into HDFS, could be coming from RDBMS. For those who are in banks, they know spreadsheets are a big store of data. <laughs> and pour the data from spreadsheets, documents, external sources. Uh, you create your Hive schema that you're going to use for read. You're going to use HQL instead of uh, inside of Spark SQL in order to do that query. And uh, this materialized result you would save in a Parquet file that you can use later on uh, if you need to further sub-process this data set. So that's kind of the functional flow. We, we do it in mean, cluster detail. I don't know, for folks who are hardware fans, it's uh, uh, you know 16 VMs running on Xeon 5, uh, 128 gig uh, memory. So it is not a, you know, we are not running on the top end of memory and you know uh, CPUs here. So this is a, and it performs really well. To give you a quick idea, this is an example. This is a trillion rows um, type of uh, table scan type queries. So there are three kinds of systems you can deploy your data systems in. One is engineered systems. Again, I'm not going to vendor, name vendors because this is all recorded. Uh, but for folks who know engineered systems, uh, you know, 128 cores, uh, uh, two terabyte memory, 12 terabyte disk, four and a half hours for that query. Um, in memory databases, again, the vendors are known. Uh, 160 cores, uh, so about about even, right? Memory CPU disk is nearly even. Uh, memory, I mean, the in memory one will have higher CPUs for natural reasons. Uh, 48 minutes, and on the Spark cluster, uh, one minute. So, again, this is a 90-10 rule. I I just want to make sure that. I'm not conveying you everything will perform this way. So the 10% of queries that you need to get access to the lake, to the vast data lake with the history where you need to derive value, those will do really well on Spark. Now, very structured queries, things that, you, you know, that, that are very well defined because the schema is very well defined upstream, they will likely do equally well and most likely do very well in the middle column there in in-memory. So you've got to be careful what tool you use for what problem set. Okay, um, finally, challenges. Um, still developing. Uh, we would love to have more people working with us in, in helping address some of the gaps. It's a phenomenal technology. Uh, came out of Berkeley Amp Lab. I heard somebody here was from Berkeley earlier. There you were. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think that this will go a, a long way in addressing some of the gaps that were there in Hadoop. Um, if you would see all the vendors in the Hadoop ecosystem have announced support for Spark. Um, so clearly there is a, a, a pointing in the right direction. Uh, but it is complicated. I mean, it's built using uh, Scala. Uh, if you want to make, um, you know, it's open source. If you want to make changes in the code and contribute, it's a little more complicated. Uh, production deployment is a little more complicated. Um, security, which is kind of my kind of pet peeve with it, um, because I worked a lot in, in putting security into Hadoop at Intel. Um, is uh, not enterprise class and need, need additional uh, capabilities. Uh, we hope to build some of that, um, uh, but we hope the, uh, the uh, industry uh, also catches up. Uh, the tool ecosystem that layers on top of that is still developing. So Spark, uh, SQL, while 
is uh, getting increasingly powerful, is still not fully SQL 92 compliant, which means the huge array of BI tools that are out there do not work out of the box. And uh, you have to write some bit of um, um, uh, Spark magic code to make that run. And uh, uh, fortunately, we have people who do that, so it's easy for us. But as a solution, as a broad-based solution for data as a service in other environments, I think uh, that challenge has to get crossed. Um, but, but the promise is really huge. I mean, if you can do this right, you can solve a huge problem that pretty much um, you know, anyone in this sort of uh, uh, ch you know, market-changing environment, especially around uh, data that needs to get accessed quickly, re uh, requests responded to rapidly over historical data sets, uh, regulatory compliance comes to mind, pharmaceuticals, financial sector, uh, healthcare sector, uh, this can be a real uh, game changer for many of those deployments. Um, and we are looking to, you know, get, uh, get in other interested folks to join the Meri band and uh, hope to uh, make the change that this needs. Can I ask a question of your system? Yeah. Um, let's say you have two banks merging, and you have two such lakes in a system, yeah. and you need to merge them. How would your system help? So there is a notion of, uh, I don't know how mature it is. Last I looked, there was a notion of HDFS federation. So you could build a federated HDFS. I, anyone is more familiar with it? I recall this year and a half ago, there was some activity on this going on in the Apache community, uh, or somebody talking about it. So but it's not normalized data between two different right. companies, right? That's okay, because remember, it is, while putting it in, it was never intended to be normalized. So the, the schema that you would use on top will have to do the normalization for you, and you will do a schema on read. As long as you can do a federated cluster, you would do schema on read. I don't have a good um, up-to-date knowledge of has the federation issue been resolved or is still in discussions in the community, but that was, I remember that was a discussion a year, year and a half ago. In that case, on most data, but then your mass data still have to be somehow merged. So that's a different exercise. Again, let's not connect the two exercises. Master data merging is a different exercise that has to happen on that bank merger, right? Because there's one uh, a, one notion of a consumer, one golden con yeah, one notion of a consumer, one notion of uh, you know what sort of relationship you have with them and all that stuff. But um, the lake itself, which has, for example, the person's credit card history forever, what they've been buying and all the other data points you have been able to collect, that as long as you don't have to pour one leg into another, which is a big effort, uh, and you can do queries across, then you can do schema on read and, and make that happen. Because how good the system is, might be determined by some of those. Yeah. Things are yeah, I think the piece that is, this is always an issue with any data system, right? It's built for a purpose, and then over time, because it's easy to write another query, why don't we use it for this other purpose? And, and Lake's purpose is really just to get data in quickly, to provide answers to those 10% of aggregations and things that otherwise require full scans and are very hard to do in any other system, and provide a staging ground to then take it into more structured environment where you would be you know, doing the kind of analysis that you're talking about. So as long as the purpose remains like that, uh, and, and there's a governance structure that keeps the purpose to that, you can do a lot because the analytics, the kind of capabilities you can now run on top of Lake to generate new business value out of that data set, that's huge. Yeah. yeah. So, um, good good questions. Questions. Uh, can you tell a little bit about the integration hub? Uh, is, is that where you're using Parquet? What, what is actually happening in that layer? No, so integration hub is actually the structured part of it. This is kind of, think of it as um, ODS and data warehouse combined. It is in one of those engineered systems. And that is where you know a lot of standard business reporting or a standard well-known set of uh, data requests are being responded to. So it's some, some kind of columnar data storage. Yeah. Like that. yeah. Parquet file is still within the lake environment where, because you want to do queries, you don't want to each time realize the same view. You can create because most of the time you would know what kind of views you need. You can create those views, store it in Parquet file. Later on, when you want to do additional queries on that stored view, you can come and do it. And is it restoring that same data, or does it have some kind of structure that it knows to? 
Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Is it duplicating the data or is it? Uh, has no, it's it's storing the response to that query. So uh, you can say in some ways it's duplicating, yeah. but it is a subset. Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's, That's what you're looking. This is where metadata comes in, right? This is why I'm saying the, the gap in the lake environment today, if you were to just put Spark inside your environment, say, I'll pour all my data, you don't want to lose that knowledge of what you're pouring in. So as long as you have that metadata environment set up on the lake, so you know what you're pouring in, then you are not that blind looking into the lake. Okay, so it becomes a layer between the analysts who are serving the business and the actual data structure. Yes. So yes, yeah, so um, on the on on the M and A, uh, if I go back to that, so if suppose take an example of a bank, right? So bank has retail banking, it has asset management and all that stuff. So in the, in that scenario, so what's the typical uh, uh, what you have seen? So do we have data as a service or sort of appliance like uh, closely aligned to that particular business line? So you have because same thing with M and A, because if if uh, something like Procter & Gamble, like which has multiple brands coming in and doing whatever fun stuff, and their, their entire business model is different. So how, what's the typical scenario? So do you know, like, uh, so they'll end up making sort of very closed loop appliances near those business lines and sort of to that. Do I, mean, I mean, the traditional environment is you have a transactional database, you have a warehouse, you have a mart, right? Maybe you, you divide your warehouse into an operational data store and a data warehouse. Um, so that would be what you would normally see in, in any environment. The only problem is, like I'm saying, businesses that are going through a lot of change and are want to use data sets that they weren't using yesterday, they, don't, they can't use that sort of a flow. So the, the idea of data as a service, and our business is like that, the idea of data as a service is to abstract that out and make the user not have to worry about where would I go and abstract that to a service layer where you give the context, you tell whether you want historical, you want lens data, you know, there's obviously you have to up-level it to a business speak, but then you can do a query without worrying about which underlying source systems or lake or warehouse or presentation layer is gonna get that data from. Okay, so so from your strategy point of view, so if suppose all this was end up, say, get, acquiring someone, yeah. Yeah, totally different business line. So the idea is that you will integrate their sort of businesses in you. We, we just go back, right? So, so just as an example, you just plug the source system. You uh, master data would not change in our industry. It is what it is. So it, it may add to that master data. You pour it into the lake, and you can do immediately some of the basic reporting you would need. And then you can, it, because the EDW projects always take time, you would then kind of bring that to Yeah, sorry. So ultimately, that 90, 10% of revision, you will send all the data from data lake into data warehouse. Not all the data, not all the data. So you see, warehouse doesn't need, uh, you know, uh, historical data beyond a point. Uh, it does, doesn't need all the demand, all the different uh, unstructured data sets you brought in in order to create some of the analytics queries. So lake will always be bigger than, vastly bigger than the warehouse. Warehouse, warehouse will be very carefully designed for a business purpose, and uh, it would be full of those facts and dimensions that you have construed to be important to run your business. And Lake would be essentially that plus everything else that you need occasionally for that 10% of the time where you need to respond to some questions that require scans that otherwise your warehouse would not be able to do, or that requires new business insights by combining some other data sets with it. That's really what the Lake is designed for. They have, have their own functions. And about the second question, about the real-time access yeah. through the data as a service? Uh, so it, it, it comes from data as a service, but we go straight to source system. So the proxy yeah. of source system. So direct to OLTP system, which is running live data? If you want uh, real-time, there is only one real-time. That is the data that is being used. Because if, let's be very clear about the definition of real-time. If you want 
the data as it exists in our environment today, it is that system. There's no other place that data exists. Yeah, people don't give access to me for that kind of data. And I have to, they give me access to the replica which is running. Yeah, so, so that's a technical backend, right? I mean, you, you could have a replica, you're replicating that data to another store, you're querying that, but that's a technical backend. And fundamentally, it's replicating every data that's written here into that replica. So logically, it's still the transactional system. It just is not touching that specific transactional instance of the database. Thank you. Yeah. How long did it take you to build the system? Well, we're still building, by the way. We're not done yet. It's a journey. Um, we are, you know, six months, five months into it. I expect us, by the time we're done, it'll be another five or six months. It's, it's a year-long thing to get that entire framework in place. But once it's in place, it actually simplifies all the capabilities of the stream. And what, was the most, what is the most challenging part of the entire? Well, honestly, the, the, the thing I'm most challenged by is the exciting capabilities of Spark with those three or four deltas that needs to get fixed in order to call this a production-ready system. So um, that's why I said the time, because there's community work going on, there's work that we are doing, but those gaps have to be filled. Gaps around security, gaps around access, gaps around deploying a metadata environment for that big data. Those are the pieces we're going to fill in. So how did you decide on Spark? How did you select it that tool? So let's look at the options, right? So you can uh, clearly go back to um, and. Um, Again, I'm trying to keep vendor names out of it. Uh, you know, well-known database uh, vendors, but there you'll come back to the issue of uh, having to define the schema on right, okay? So if you get that out of equation, you got HBase, you can use um, Cassandra, you can use Hadoop. The problem then is that those 10% of the queries that I need those compliance type queries to be run and responded to, this will take, you know, days for me to do that. And the CDH type systems have scale issues. HDFS doesn't have scale issue, but if I'm running Hive straight on it, it'll take me hours, sometimes days to run those queries. So when you look at the option set, you soon kind of limit, your, your set of tool set is somewhat limited, actually. It, it comes down to Spark very quickly. So you did a proof of concept to come up with Spark, right? Uh, we have a lot of proof of concepts running at all time, given that we are labs. <laughs> so I, I suspect even now somebody's testing something that is next generation of Spark called something else, and I don't know about it. Something else, and I don't know about it. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do you manage your own? What are the rules? You mean the access rules, or you're talking, when you say rule? Oh, so we used rules as our rules engine, uh, but we have layered a lot of capabilities on top of that in order to provide rules management for it. And we incorporate those rules into the runtime environments at access. So the rules can always be managed externally to the system, lifecycle externally to the system, and then get deployed into the system, and then get deployed. Yeah. What parts are not automated, and then what are you trying to do automated? Several things that are not automated. Are. Why do you think we're hiring engineers? <laughs> um, so um, the this um, uh, I would say there are some elements of Lake that are still under construction. I wouldn't say not automated. I just say they are under construction, um, which is another way of saying the same thing. Um, then uh, on the metadata piece, uh, having the queries automatically when you make the queries on Spark have them automatically refer to or use the knowledge of metadata that came into the system is something that is still in design phase. So it's more development, I would say, than automation. Uh, we just have to get more work done. Uh, we just have to get more work yeah. done. Yeah. What are some, some of the biggest challenges you had to deploy the Spark? Yeah, I mean, it's, if you have played with Hadoop, like, 400 days ago, it's the same exact kind of challenges, right? I mean, the stuff, the, the, it takes, there's a life of maturity of some of these projects. First, they try to focus on functionality, capability, 
and then they focus on maturation. So now the focus is on maturation, but what you would use today is still deployment is a bit complex, um, management is complex, keeping a running environment operating, having uh, metrics coming out of that that you can monitor in a production environment, that's complex. Um, integration with some of the other tools that we use, like BI tools I talked about, MicroStrategy and so on. That is just getting announced and just betas are still, still coming out. So it is moving very fast, uh, much faster than it did for Hadoop actually, to be honest, but it is not there yet. So uh, those are the challenges we continue to face and we are hopefully solving them one by one. Any other questions? Can I ask very quickly, on the data as a service layer, uh, and maybe I missed it, can you talk a little bit about the detail of what's in there? Because I, I get the impression that it's uh, perhaps like a SOAP or a XML type a API, it's simply a query and response, and on the back end there seems to be some some routing based on what context you're asking is is that correct or is it yeah so essentially you know what you would have what you would have is a, a bus kind of environment you have to have a mechanism that can do both event based and request response right you need to be able to look up uh, in the authentication authorization entitlements management framework and you need to be able to look up in uh, the rules management framework that defines some of the rules on who gets you know how this access is structured what sort of Context is there's a reference data element which defines the kinds of context that you will use in order to define your query. So again, a lot of things under construction, but those are the elements of it. It's Kevin. Sorry, okay, speak up. Can you speak up, Kevin, if you don't mind? So I, I think I said this a little earlier, which is when you're onboarding data, you have to keep that context of what you're boarding, where you're boarding from, what this data is, in, a, for lack of a better word, a metadata layer available for querying on that system. Now, this is not a transactional querying type system, so it will require some level of data management person being involved in order to design the query. It is not, without the tooling fully in place, the BI tooling that I'm talking about with the metadata integrated, the analyst will still not be independent. Now when the metadata tooling is integrated and you do have BI tools directly being able to peer into it while uh, using the metadata, then you can get to some of the existing tool sets in other data management environments. There is a gap, and, and that gap is something we are striving to fill by our own development, but hopefully community catches up and provides a lot of that. No, it's not. Actually, these will be, uh, again, I'm not trying to be an advertiser of commercial products. So th these are all commercial products. The only open source one is what I've talked about mostly today. Uh, all the source systems are commercial database products. Uh, master data management is a commercial master data management product. Uh, Integration Hub is a traditional uh, EDW type solution on a, on a uh, engineered system type deployment. Um, and presentation layer is something that would be, again, a mart based on typical database type marts. Can you show the performance? Yeah. Um, Spark, just to be clear, not Hadoop. Spark, not, not, Hadoop can be many things to many people, just being specific about Apache Spark. Yeah. 
So the data lakes storage system, the file system is HDFS, Hadoop distributed file system. The runtime layer is the in-memory layer, the Apache Spark in-memory layer on top. Um, so I'm trying to make sure I understand your question before I answer it. That's it. HDFS in the data lake. That's it. And do you see the difference in performance for a performing in data lake versus other? Yeah, so for certain kinds of queries, the full scan type of queries that I showed, you know, one example that I showed where we had a trillion rows and we were trying to query it. Uh, uh, when we were ETLing it, those were trillion rows. And when we were querying from lake, we were getting one minute, I believe. I don't have that in front of me. Uh, response time. One minute response time. So that's an example of when we are using Spark on HDFS. Uh, the other examples on the left-hand side are commercial, either in-memory databases or engineered systems. Am I addressing your question? Just to go a little deeper, if you, yeah. if you Well, it's not a small data set. So small data set could be one reason because you're, you, you would not get as much advantage out of Hadoop. But the other reason is what a lot of people here have talked about, which is, you know, when you are using presentation layer with a business reporting type of tool set, you typically are trying to get to very specific in information in a very well-predefined manner. I mean, why would you take all the overhead of Hadoop when you have very well-engineered systems addressing that problem set. It's just the, the tool doesn't fit the problem set, right? I mean, the, the HDFS-based Spark system you would use when you could have data that has size, that has some level of uh, variations in structured, unstructured, where you have a notion of, I want to get the data in quickly. That's my first task. How do I get the data in quickly rather than how do I get the data in right? Uh, that is a task that can be done later. Those are not the characteristics of the presentation layer. Data needs to be correct. It needs to provide the right report. Uh, you know the structure of what you're going to provide a priori. So that's where you typically would deploy a mark. Pardon? Query performance is important, but because a priori you know what you're querying, you can index it well, or you can put it in an in-memory system, which is not the case in the lake environment. So we can have one last question. Can you tell a little bit about the ETL technology you're using? Are you using some, some Hadoop ecosystem ETL or using uh... it's a, We are using commercial tool, uh, but obviously there are various options there, uh, open source and commercial tools. So both, both into the data lake and out, of, out into the integration hub? Yeah, we just happen to have, uh, uh, again, not trying to pitch any one of these products. Um, we happen to have very good licensing with one of the products, and we are using that. And there's no specific, I would say, rationale you couldn't use an open source tool. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so just if you can use a use case where, where you mentioned Redfin, right? Yeah. How are you helping Redfin? Just one use? Yeah, so loan to value, so you know, a classic use case is we want to figure out historical, this is just one simple example which we can all relate to. Historically, how loan to value ratio has changed, right? Uh, in a particular zip code, so let's say in Cambridge. Um, although it's, there's not enough variation here, so maybe not a good example. So pick Phoenix, okay, and a zip code within Phoenix. So now you have huge amounts of data. You have Redfin stream coming in that tells you what the values are today, or at least at as good a proxy as you can get. Maybe there's other sources you can get, but that's one. You have a lake environment in which you have 30 years worth of data, or maybe 60 years, it depends on how big that lake is and how long you've been storing data. You have a humongous stream of data. You can very quickly generate that LTV for that particular zip code. You, you know, 
it's, it's actually, if you were to run on any normal system, just designing that data set and getting that data set out will take you several weeks, let alone running the query. And you could do this all in you know, an hour or two. Okay. So thank you so much, Girish. I thank think you. it was helpful. So, uh, so you, you are around, right, for a few? Yeah, I'm, I'm around. So if yeah, anyone wants to have any specific query, just get hold of Girish. So, awesome. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.